Well, a good morning to all of you, and thank you for joining us here this morning at the Cathedral of the Most Holy Trinity on this 23rd of August, the 11th Sunday after Trinity. We welcome all of those who are present here with us at the Cathedral. As has been mentioned, those who are listening over the radio and those who are joining us via Zoom and via YouTube, it's great for us to be worshiping together. Uh, this morning, Father Paul Dean will be assisting at St. Paul's Church in Paget, uh, and so we pray for him today. The hymns, first and last, have been chosen today because they are particular favorites of uh, Canon Norman, or at least they're the ones that Mary Claire has been singing to give her strength during these difficult times. So I hope that you will join in singing these hymns with the gusto that not only the tunes but the words deserve as they focus our minds on God's goodness and on his faithfulness. As we uh, pause, we remember that uh, we meet in the presence of a God who is good and kind. Uh, this week, we've been asked by Canon Norman uh, and Mary, uh, Mary Claire, to remember him particularly with his breathing. He is still on a ventilator. Do please pray for him as he adjusts. He had a tracheotomy this week, which should enable him to be uh, free of the intubation. Uh, do please pray for him. He's getting some feeling when, uh, when you touch his legs, which is really very exciting. But they have discovered another abscess in his body, which needs treatment. So there's an ongoing and very slow progress happening. But they are living with hope and buoyed up by our prayers. And in just a moment, as they join in with us, they will be buoyed up by the singing of our opening hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
I greet you all in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Together we pray the prayer of preparation as we say, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God the Father forgives us in Christ, and he heals us by the Holy Spirit. So let us therefore put away all anger and bitterness, all slander and malice, and confess our sins to God, our Redeemer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who does forgive all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and keep you in life eternal through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We bow our heads for the special colic prayer for this 11th Sunday after Trinity. As we pray, O oh God, you declare your almighty power, most chiefly in showing mercy and pity. Mercifully grant to us such a measure of your grace that we, running the way of your commandments, may receive your gracious promises and be made partakers of your heavenly treasure. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please do sit for our readings. The first reading is from Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, to chapter 2. Verse 10, now a new king rose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. 
Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will, they will increase. And in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Python and Ramesses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in, in, in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get a nurse for you from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. This is the word of the Lord. A reading from Psalms 124. The response, our help is in the name of the Lord. Uh, our help is in, is the, in the name of the Lord. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us the prey to their teeth. Our help is in the name of the Lord. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Our help is in the name of the Lord.
Second reading is from Romans 12, verses 1 to 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And, he, and they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, 
and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the gospel of Christ. From our opening hymn, he speaks and listening to his voice, new life the dead receive. So hear him, ye deaf, his praise ye done. Gracious Father, we thank you that you speak to us today through your word. We pray that we would hear what you have to teach us, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the works of the Scottish poet called Robbie Burns. He's famous in one of his poems called To a Mouse. Imagine doing a poem to a mouse, but nonetheless, uh, he says this, the best laid schemes are mice and men gang aft a glee. Now, does that make any sense to you? It means basically the best laid schemes of mice and men often go awry or get messed up. Well, if there was ever a time when we experienced that truth, it is in this climate that we've been living for these last few months. We've discovered how frail and impotent we are. Our hubris and our pride have taken a real bashing with the ongoing onslaught of COVID-19. All of our best laid plans, well, they've gone awry, haven't they? And the events that have transpired in our lives and in this church family also since July the 30th just remind us once again of our frailty. You know, this is my seventh year as a bishop, and uh, the interesting thing about being a bishop is that you can say things and intend for things to happen, but in three seconds, they get knocked aside by everyone else, and the plans that you make, just, they just frittle away, and you have to make new ones. But as we look at it, our world, it's not just COVID, but the whole political realm in which we're leaving, where people have intentions, and then they're falling apart by all kinds of different forces. You read the news about Belarus and uh, about Mali, and you look at the confusion caused with the U.S. election coming up, the best laid plans. But our plans, we need to contrast with God's plans, the plans of the Lord God Almighty. And in our readings today, we have a common theme. In the Old Testament, we have a promise that God made to, to Abraham being fulfilled in the midst of an extraordinarily difficult situation. Many, many hundreds of years before, God had made a promise to Abraham that his spiritual descendants would be as numerous as stars in the sky, and that from his offspring, all the earth would be blessed. Well, for the descendants of Abraham who are in slavery in Egypt and have been there for 400 years, that promise may have seemed uh, vain, hollow words, as they suffered under the hands of cruel slave masters, and things only seem to be getting worse. And yet, as the book of Exodus opens, we see how God is actually acting on his promises. He, in fact, told Abraham that it would be about 400 years before his people would be released. And if you read those verses again and go back, you see how the people multiplied and multiplied and multiplied as numerous as the stars in the heavens. They kept on multiplying regardless of what Pharaoh did or Pharaoh threatened or Pharaoh thought. He had a genocide that he was planning against the eldest son, against the sons. It didn't happen. God's plan was working in the midst of that terrible situation. And he was raising up a savior as he promised the boy who was called being drawn out, Moses. And the irony is, of course, that the Pharaoh who sought to destroy the Israelite people was actually feeding, clothing, and paying for their savior by having Moses come into his house. So God has the last word always. And the book of Exodus is that story about how no power on earth can withstand the fulfillment of God's promises. But of course, the Exodus is only a tiny picture of a bigger plan that God is enacting in his world. 
starting with another baby born in Bethlehem who would live, who would die, it seemed, in having been cursed in weakness, but actually who was raised from the dead, the man Jesus Christ, the Son of God, through whom God was establishing a kingdom. And as we read from our gospel this morning, for all those who are part of this kingdom, in faith, connected to the king, the gates of Hades or hell itself will not prevail against God. No matter what Satan may throw at them, the biggest superpower in the world in Egypt, Satan himself, none of these things are going to affect the ability of God to accomplish his purposes through his people. In the Psalm, it says, our help is in the name of the Lord. If we didn't have God on our side, we would be completely helpless, but we have God on our side, and therefore we always have hope that his promises will be fulfilled. And why should they be fulfilled for us? Is it because we deserve it? The psalm ends with because of his mercy. The Apostle Paul, and this is where I'm going to spend our time this morning, speaks about living in the light of God's mercy. We have a calling to fulfill. As part of God's plan and purposes, he doesn't just act on his own. He's always using his people like Moses, like Abraham, and now like us. Paul's language is very deliberate in these verses, and he wants us to have a proper view of God and of ourselves that would help us to live out the plans he has for his world. Towards God, he makes an appeal to them. He's, he calls them brothers and sisters. He's writing to a very divided church, a racially and spiritually divided church. The church in Rome had two component parts. There were the Jewish Christians, there were the Gentile Christians. Both of them looked down on the other and said that they were the true faith, the true church. But Paul speaks to both groups as his brothers and sisters. And throughout the book of Romans, he has been reminding them that both of them, Jew or Gentiles, have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one of them is good. No one can claim to be better than anything else. All are under God's wrath because all of them have turned away from his plans and purposes. But God has revealed a righteousness that comes not through their works, how good they are, but through Christ's gift of himself a righteousness that God gives to them based on his love that they receive by faith. And that puts them on a completely even keel. And so for the first 11 chapters, he's been explaining the mercies of God, that God's love is being poured out upon all people, and that though we are sinners, Christ died for us so that we might be in relationship to him for eternity as one body. And having received this extraordinary mercy of God that we did not deserve, he then tells us to live out our faith. We are, of course, all of us sinful. All of us are lost. Yet we are also totally loved, forgiven, accompanied, and everything is working out for our good. Whatever happens in our world, in our community, in our families, in our own lives, brothers and sisters, we have received an unspeakable mercy from the grace of God to save us. And this should shape and motivate how, what we do and how we relate to God. And as you look at these verses, you can see he invites them to, firstly, in verses 1 to 3, to offer up their bodies and their minds in total submission to him, total commitment Jesus presented himself as a sacrifice for us. And he then asks us, commands us to present our bodies as a sacrifice for him, a living sacrifice. What is a sacrifice? Something that has been set apart. Something that is totally committed to the object. Something that is uh, dedicated to, and wholeheartedly involved. It's a sacrifice of both of our, of our bodies, that is our appetites, our passions, our everyday lives. There's some people who think that God's only really interested in my spiritual life. 
But here we see in these verses that he's concerned about all of us. The message translation of this passage says this. He says, take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Our lives are not our own. We are not the masters of our fate. We are been bought at a price. Therefore, we offer God our bodies, everything we are, all of life. It's not just people who wear dog collars who are called into the ministry. Every single one of us is called to offer up our lives in response to God's mercy to us. This applies to all people who are in his family, to all ages at all time, whether you're at work or at school. Worship. We sometimes think that we come to church to worship as if this is the only place that it happens. Well, I hope that it does happen when we come here that we worship the living God, but actually worship is 24 seven. It's the offering of our lives in response to what God has done, doing our very best for him as an act of thankfulness. That is worship. So how you wash the dishes is worship. How you treat the people in the supermarket line is worship to God. If you're loving others as Christ loved you, that is an act of worship. If you are serving, the all these things that we do, the way we choose to speak and not speak, the things we say and don't say, it's all worship. But not only do we present our bodies, he says, but your minds. That's the thing. This is the thing that controls everything else. Negatively, it says, do not be conformed. Don't let the world shape you into its mold, as it says in another translation. Don't let your minds be conformed by the world around you. I don't know if you read the newspaper yesterday, but you saw that the uh, aquarium and zoo is now back open and they had a wonderful picture of a chameleon in there. I don't know if you saw it. Beautiful thing. But what do chameleons do? Wherever, what environment they're in, they change to suit their environment. Last week, we had a few days off and I had the joy of going uh, snorkeling. And we watched this hogfish uh, in the midst of, the, uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, the, the ferns and stuff like that on the bottom, dark brown. And as, it, it, as we approached, it swam out into the, the white, uh, to the sandy bottom, and it turned silver like that. It was changing its color to match its environment. Now, they do that for protection. But as Christians, we are called not to constantly be camouflaged and hidden away like everybody else. We're called to stand out and be different, not to allow the world to shape our values and the way that we do things and the things that we prize. Negatively, don't be conformed, but positively, transform your minds, the seat of all of this stuff, recognizing how important what we put in affects the performance. So my bike, if I should go to uh, the Tiger Mart later on and put diesel in my bike, it will not work properly. What we put in will affect the performance. So it is with what we eat. We're very careful about what we put into our bodies these days. You're told no sugar, no salt, you know, uh, we've got to watch your fats, all this kind of stuff. What we put in affects, so we're very careful about these things. Why are we not more careful about what we're putting into our minds? The things that we watch, the books we read, social media and whatever. I know I'm as guilty as the, the next person. It's just so easy, isn't it, to be fed by this stuff that's barraging. Instead, our minds need constant renewing. I don't know if your garden is like mine, but this week we had that wonderful rain. And what was brown almost overnight turned into something green because it had been watered. Our minds need constant renewing, constant feeding with God's word so that we can have a fuller and better understanding of God's will for us. His will, which is described in these verses as perfect and pleasing and right. So as you think of God in response to his mercies, offer your bodies as a sacrifice to him. Renew your minds daily so that you can think his thoughts. But then towards yourself and towards others, how are you to think in light of God's mercy? He calls us to what I would describe as proper self-reflection. Don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought, but with sober judgment. There are many people in this world, as we know, that love themselves, that think that they're God's gift to the world. They think of themselves very highly. But there are also others in this world who despise themselves, who hate themselves, who want to be someone else. 
and are constantly trying to amend their lives to look like, be like, think like, act like somebody else. Sober judgment involves us seeing ourselves as we are. And what is that? Someone fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. Someone who is at the same time a sinner who has fallen short in many ways. And we're all in that boat. So we have no right to judge or condemn others. But yet someone who is loved by God and saved by his grace so that we are part and adopted in his family. We are depraved but loved, rebels but forgiven, not perfect but being sanctified and perfected by the God who is working out everything for our good to make us more like Jesus. We are God's masterpiece. An unfinished work, but on the way to becoming more and more glorious. And this perspective on ourselves frees us from the need for everybody else's approval and protects us, or should do, against the pride that is so destructive or against the self-loathing that inhibits we have to have a proper sober judgment of ourselves, which neither devalues nor overvalues, but puts God in his place. We're to be like Christ, but we know how far we fall short of being like Christ. Therefore, we, we are to preach the gospel because we know that Christ came to save sinners, to make us more like him. Those two things holding them in tandem, the standard and the help to be who God wants us to be. But in this economy, this sober reflection also influences how we see others in relationship to ourselves. Nobody is better or worse. We are fellow members of one body. Each person, each other person is as valuable as you are, as necessary to the body, as purposeful in God's plans. We're all different and unique with different skills and attributes and gifts. But those things are given so that they may be used to build up each other, not coveting what other people have in their gifts and skills and talents, but being who we are in terms of who God has made us to be with all of our experiences and who we are and valuing the other and working together as one. We don't all have the same function, but we all have a function within Christ's body. There's no place in Christ's church for rank individualism. No place for lone rangers. But again, there's no place for the herd mentality either, where everybody does exactly the same thing and follows in exactly the same path and dresses exactly the same. In musical terms, we are not soloists, nor do we all play in unison. We are like an orchestra of many parts, with each part having a role to play. Sometimes one part will take the leaves, but the other parts are there to continue to play and to fill out the sound. The sad thing is that there's a few people playing and a lot of people who haven't picked up their instruments. This week, I, I found something that I haven't seen for a very long time, my old clarinet. And I just remember so well learning to play the clarinet and what a painful exercise it was for all those who had to listen. I could play for you now, but I haven't played it for about 25 years, so you might hear the pain rather than enjoy the pleasure of playing. But the thing is that when I learned to play, I also joined a band. And uh, the thing about being in a band is that everyone's playing their parts, and sometimes you make squeaks. And when you're playing a clarinet, it's a really awful sound. Would you like to hear a squeak? <laughs> no, I don't think you do. But the, the thing is that we all will make squeaks. We will all make a mess of it. But we need to play nonetheless. We need to practice. We need to fulfill our role and our part in the life of the body. We need to encourage each other. But the thing is we need to play the right tune. Who is the conductor? It's not the world. It's not what I want to play. If you're in an orchestra, you play what the conductor conducts. And who is that? That's Jesus Christ. And what is he asking you to play? The script that is written, the score, which is his word, guided by the Holy Spirit. He invites us all to play his tune, which is a tune of love. It's a tune of building up. It's a tune of reaching out. It's a tune of inviting the orchestra so that it grows bigger and bigger and bigger, so that we all make an amazing noise and so that the world will hear the sound of God through our lives and through our ministry. That's what he's calling us to do. I'll put this thing away before I get tempted. 
And in this list, we have the facts of that, that there are many different gifts. Paul only lists a few here. There are many other different lists of gifts that there are that God gives. So here he lists a few of them. Prophecy, which is building people up with God's word, encouraging or consoling others. Serving, which is any kind of ministry, practical or emotional, uh, helping other people. Teaching building other people up with uh, what we have been given, we then hand on to others. Leadership. Are you a leader? Well, may I say, if you have influence over the lives of anybody else, you are in a leadership position. If you are in that position, use it to build them up, to teach them, to show them the way, to guard, to protect, to, to lead. Mercy, the gift of mercy or compassion. Gosh, we need that in our world today. And we as God's people have been shaped by God's mercy and compassion. So we should use that gift. But all of these roles are given not for our own benefit. I teach not because I like to teach and it makes me look good. I teach to teach others so that they can grow. I give not to boast about how much I've given, but so that other people might be blessed by what I have received myself. These gifts are not to be exercised half-heartedly or when we feel up to it but always with zeal, with generosity, with cheerfulness, with humility. As I say, this list is not exhaustive. There are many other such gift lists in the New Testament, but you've all got gifts to share. Every one of you, if you have been called by Christ, he has given you something to share. So you need to pick up your instrument and play it. And if you make mistakes, that's okay. We're all in it together, We're all learning and growing together. And ultimately, the more we practice, the more we use our gifts and skills, the more we share these things with others, the more the body will grow and the better we will sound and look to the world around us. But Paul tells us today, the apostle, that whatever is our gift, to use it fully and joyfully, not for your benefit alone, but for the building up of the whole. God's promises and his plans will never fail Nothing can undermine his purposes, neither human might nor the gates of hell, nor our weaknesses and sins. But as members of his church who have received his mercy, we have a part to play in helping to realize these things by using our gifts, by valuing one another, and by working together in view of his mercy to us. We had an exciting vestry meeting this last week. Uh, it was sad, obviously, because Canon Norman wasn't able to be with us. And one of the things we talked about was how to ensure that the good work that he is involved in, the pastoral care, the outreach of the cathedral continues. And we were reminded of the importance of each one of us in recognizing and playing our role and using our gifts. It is not the ministry of the few, it is the ministry of all. For our church, not just to survive, but to grow and to reach out, every one of us needs to play our part. I'm so grateful to the members of the guild and to our Eucharistic ministers who are very happy, it seems, to go out and give pastoral care to those in homes and those who can't get out so that we as a whole body may feel connected to one another and continue to be blessed by the Lord. But it's not just for them. It's for every single person who sits in this cathedral, who's watching over Zoom, who's listening over the airwaves. You have a role to play in the fulfillment of God's amazing purposes to bring his gospel news to the whole ends of the earth. So I invite you this morning, wherever you are and whoever you are, to a sober reflection, a sober judgment on yourself remembering that you are loved by God and he has gifted every one of you in his service to say, Lord, how can I be used by you? And then to step out with others together that we may show forth God's love to this world. That is what the world needs at this time. And that is why God has called us into his family. So shall we pause as we lay our own lives to him in prayer, recalling that at the end of every communion service, what do we say? We say, through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. So send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. We keep a moment of silence as we reflect upon what we've heard and as we ask for God to show us our gifts and to have a realization of his mercy and to be merciful to others. Loving Father, this morning, we remember how 
Even though we were sinners, God demonstrates his love for us in this, that he died for us, that we might live. Lord God, we thank you for your mercy, which we receive from you day by day. We pray that this mercy would stir us up to offer our bodies to renew our minds as living sacrifices to you. We pray that you would help us to value one another and to have the courage to use the gifts that you've given to each one of us. Help us to know what our individual gifts are and help us then to offer them back to you in service of others for the building up of your kingdom. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we think about these things, we stand together and we affirm together the things that we believe about our God. We say the words of the Nicene Creed as we proclaim, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Now I invite you to sit or kneel as we now come to share in prayers together. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. Dear Lord, we lift to you this morning our prayers, thanking you for being a good father who moves in ways beyond our comprehension and loves us more deeply than we may ever know. We thank you for the start of a new week that will bring with it new opportunities for growth, to serve and to be used as a living sacrifice for you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father, we pray for your world with all its immense beauty and immense brokenness. Lord, we know you can move in miraculous ways. We pray for the protests and violence in Belarus and the coup in Mali. Lord, let your peace be what reigns in these nations. Help those who have the power to do what is right, to do what is right for the people, protecting justice and freedom, protecting the weak, the oppressed, and all peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as we look at the world, we also pray for all those who are still suffering from the COVID-19 pandemic, from having lost loved ones, being sick themselves, economic loss, and all the ways that lives have been affected by this illness. Lord, we lift up to you each person, knowing you see them and have heard their cries. Please guide world leaders as they continue to find ways to protect their people. Please help communities love one another well in this time and shine a light where each individual can play their part to serve one another during this plight. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we pray for Bermuda in this time. We pray for its economic recovery following the effects of the pandemic. We pray that as a nation, we will continue to grow in unity, in caring for one another and in wisdom. Lord, we pray for the upcoming election, that your will be done as you bring people into power, raise up leaders, that they will love your ways, promote growth and promote unity. 
We pray for our Premier, the leader of the opposition, the governor, and all our leaders. Give them wisdom, strength, clarity, and diligence to lead like Christ as we move into the coming months of transition and change. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for the Church of Bermuda, for the upcoming time of interregnum at St. James and St. Anne's. Lord, we pray for the cathedral family in this time as we especially lift up to you Norman, Mary Claire, and their whole family. Lord, we ask that you bring strength to the church in this season and that you bring miraculous healing and abundant peace to Norman. We pray for the whole church worldwide at this time, particularly in those places of persecution, that you will bring refuge and hope to all those people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we lift up to you this morning the sick, the suffering, the sad, the lonely, unemployed, addicted, the lost, all those in need of comfort. Lord, we pray for families as they prepare for their children to return to school. Let them be provided with all they need and the children will be equipped for the year ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father, as we heard in the readings of Romans today, help our lives to be a living sacrifice for your will. Let us live in unity with one another, seeking to love as you love us and open our eyes to how we can be using the gifts you have given us to the glory of your name, to live like Christ, trusting that your promises will never fail. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. Can I invite you all now to stand with me? And in a moment, we, of course, will be sharing communion in one kind together. But as we do so, not only are we called to live at peace with God, but we are called to live at peace with each other. As usual, we're not going to share the peace in the normal way of shaking hands, but with a nod, a wave, a prayer, a peace signal, however it is appropriate for you. So peace to you from God, our Heavenly Father. Peace from his son, Jesus Christ, who is our peace. Peace from the Holy Spirit, the life giver. The peace of the triune God be always with you. Would you like to offer to each other a sign of God's peace? And just a reminder before we sing our offertory hymn this morning, for those who are visiting us today, if you've not received communion here with us before, uh, you're welcome to do so. Simply go as directed. The choir will come first. Please keep your masks on as you come up, uh, and we'll go up the center aisle and back through the south aisle this way in, the, in, in a circular motion. Please go as directed by others, but all are welcome to come forward to receive the communion. And one thing I did want to just point out uh, to you, at the end of the service, you know, we say, uh, we talk about... Uh, uh, feeding us with the body and blood of your son. You may think that by not having the wine this morning that you're not getting the quote-unquote blood of Christ, but actually these things are reminders to us of Christ's body and blood, which he gave to us all those years ago, that one perfect sacrifice. And we're thinking about that when we're saying those words. So even though we only receive bread, they're a symbol of the whole of Christ's giving of his body and his blood for us. The, the bread which feeds us, the covenant sealed with his blood, those are represented, all of them, in the giving and receiving of the bread. So although you may not be drinking wine, you are still able to say that we're receiving the body and blood of Christ because we receive the benefits that he gives us by his spirit, of which the bread is a sign and symbol for us, if that makes sense to you. So now we sing together, Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine.
So blessed are you, Lord God, of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God, of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us our spiritual drink. Blessed be God forever. And so the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. And let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. Father, we do give you thanks and praise through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Savior. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will, and he won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Lord, you are holy indeed, the source of all holiness. Grant that by the power of your Holy Spirit and according to your holy will, these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on that same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and he gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Well, great is the mystery of faith. And so, Father, calling to mind his death upon the cross, that perfect sacrifice made once for the sins of the whole world, rejoicing in his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate this memorial of our redemption. And as we offer you this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, we bring before you this bread and this cup and thank you for counting us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. Send the Holy Spirit upon your people and gather into one in your kingdom all who share this one bread and one cup so that we in the company of all the saints may praise and glorify you forever through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom and in whom in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. So now let us pray with confidence as our Savior Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, now we do break this bread to share in the body of Christ, that though we are many, we are one body because we all share in one bread. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word and I shall be healed. <clears throat> now we know that many of us during this time of pandemic are not able to join in. So each week we do say this prayer of solidarity, spiritual communion, if you like, as we say together what we believe. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits you have given me for all the pains and the insults you have borne for me. By your Spirit, please come into my heart. O most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may I know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly day by day. Amen.
Amen. How great he is indeed. Well, as we prepare now to go out into the world, I just want to say that immediately following this service, there will be a service of holy baptism. So if I can invite you to um, make your way out the church in a timely manner so that the baptism family are able to come in, that would be really helpful. I don't want anyone to rush away, but uh, we do need to get the church ready for uh, a baptism service. But I do want to uh, wish everyone who has a birthday this week coming a very happy birthday. Amongst them, I see Emily Foster Skelton. She must be about 21, is it, this week? Or somewhere like that, yes. But we wish her a very happy birthday, as we do for all of those others who are celebrating this week. And a reminder that we do remember and pray for those who, who are mourning, those who are remembering the loss of loved ones. In terms of announcements, you, I'm sure many of you are involved already with the website, which gives you updates on Canon Norman's progress. There's nothing further to report this morning, but just to say, please do continue for, his, uh, for the ability for him to breathe independently and for the uh, res resolution of this little abscess issue, and that he would have the strength to begin the whole process. They're hoping he might go into rehab this week later on if things continue to go well. So do play, pray for that. Well, Lord of all mercy, as we pray, we, your faithful people, have celebrated that one true sacrifice which takes away our sin and brings pardon and peace. By our communion, keep us firm on the foundation of the gospel and preserve us from all sin through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Together we pray, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. So go now in the peace of Christ. Thanks be to God.